Guys, how's the form? Thanks so much for joining us here. Episode 2 of the Ditches podcast in collaboration with Red Wolf Media. I'm joined here by the two other senior hurlers, Roman Shorthall on my right, Polly Doyle on my left. Thanks so much for joining us here. Polly, say something nice about Leo Varadkar. He was a decent man. Uh, he did 20 years of public service and I just feel like now is not the time to criticise him. I think if you've nothing good to say... You should wait until you wait until the, enough time. Let him have his moment, and then say, "Let your criticisms come out." There'll be time enough for that. Roman, something nice? Um, yeah, I'd agree with Polly. Uh, I don't think we should even be discussing him today. We should let him have his moment, <laughs> and I think it would be rude to talk about him. Well, that's stay with us, guys. We're going to have a wonderful cavalcade of guests, including. CEO of Vulcan Consulting, Lucinda Creighton, who's going to talk to us about how we need more honesty and transparency in politics. She's going to be joining us later on. To let you in on a little trade secret, this podcast isn't live. Uh, we've just got news about Leo Varadkar's resignation as both Taoiseach and leader of Fine Gael. We're waiting to hear who's going to be the next leader of the party and of the country. Looks like it's going to be decided by the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party, which should be good crack, if nothing else. Uh, to start off, an, an honest question. Uh, go to you first, Roman. Um, what does Leo Varadkar believe in? What's his ideology? Well, <clears throat> I think the answer can be found, like in, you know, our fucking housing crisis, our health service, um, record homelessness. Um, I think like that, that, that kind of answers everything that you need to know about his politics or his ideology. It, it, it just you know can all kind of um, you know be summarised by um, the state. That the that the country is in, and the state that uh, you know, the, as I said, the health services and um, housing is in. You know, how much of the responsibility for that is on Varadkar? Well, I mean, you know, government has like a collective responsibility, but you know, he is the leader. He's been in power now for I think nearly seven years, so I would say a lot. And what do you think he believes in? I think his actual opinions kind of slip through for all of the spin doctors that he's employed, for all of the kind of PR people he has on, on staff. You know, he, he's, he's quite, um, as a political correspondent might say, gaff prone, right? He, uh, there was the, what he said in the run up to the referendum about the state not having a duty of care to people. There were previous comments he made during the COVID pandemic about how he'd heard stories about how people were scrounging off the COVID benefits. There was the infamous well, remark. Well, do cheat us all. They do. We'll get to that later. <laughs> there was the infamous remark about um, how Tiny Tim should get a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, a banger. Um, I think that's what he believes in. You know, really, that um, the state doesn't really have a duty to care for people. That um, you know, people who um, are rich deserve the money that's theirs, and they should have to pay a minimal amount of tax and. People who are poor can go fuck themselves, <laughs> more or less. And, uh, but I mean, he, he has had, you know, he's had 20 years of a career in public life. Very actually, I mean, one thing that I kind of like to kind of think about and, and kind of ponder on is uh, who, are, who are his people, who are his constituency? I mean, extremely, he... He's been extremely unsuccessful electorally since become since since becoming leader of Fine Gael. Last general election, and I know that like there was that popular hashtag "Not My T Shock," which drove people fucking mad. Like you know, people <laughs> people who studied politics at DCU basically like that that kind of person. Also, you know, one thing that was always one thing that's routinely held against him is that what it was the he was elected on the fifth count um over in dublin west do you know the word those uh those images of him at the count center yeah with matt beside him just kind of going oh is it going to be this one is it going to be this one and again like it's routinely held against him um also drives people 
crazy <laughs> about how, like, you know, do these people not know that we live, um, <laughs> that we live in a country that has proportional representation by a single transferable vote? I learned this in my CSPE class. Yeah. You know? When, like, of course, it does say something about and that, you know, a sitting Taoiseach had to wait until the fifth count. He was that unpopular in what is, uh, well, you know, relatively, well, certainly by national standards, a relatively, like, it's an affluent constituency. You know, it's kind of mixed, maybe. Yeah, parts of it would be. And, you know, there had been, obviously it's not going to come to pass now. I'm also kind of, like, reluctant to, I, I kind of feel, uh, I don't want to go too far down the road of the mainstream Paul core here and just talk about the soap opera of all this bullshit. But like there had been talk of him um, moving constituency and running in Dublin Bay South, which is, you know, the archetypal Fine Gael constituency, you know. But to bring it back down to who do you think are the people who uh, kept Varadkar in situ for both as, you know, both as leader of Fine Gael and the country? as well as, you know, his succession of ministerial posts. Like, to whom did he owe his whatever level of electoral success he did have? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, like, it's one thing to be elected as a TD. And as you said, like, we have this system of uh, PR and, you know, it's not first past the post. So, I mean... You know, in, in terms of like getting elected, you just have to get enough people to vote for you in one constituency. But I, I've always been kind of surprised that, um, you know, that he's lasted this long as leader of Fine Gael. I mean, it's, I, I think like, you know, Fine Gael is different to where Fianna Fáil is at at the moment, which is kind of like, there's nobody there that you could kind of, pick out and say, yeah, this person could replace Michal Martin and be leader of the party. I mean, I think a lot of people would kind of share that view, you know. Whereas with Fine Gael, like, I mean, there are people there that, and like, this is what's going to happen now in a couple of weeks, there are people there that could, uh, you know, that want and could lead the party. People, you know, like Simon Harris and Pascal Donoghue. But that that's why I, I just could never understand like given you know all these as, as paulie said gaffes and everything and just you know i would say like unpopularity like with a lot of a lot of people um that you know nobody ever kind of challenged him for the leadership but i mean maybe that suggests like that you know um you know, he, he, he was good uh, at that part of the job, you know, of, of kind of keeping everyone in control, good. you know. He was propped up by um, the media as well and allies of his in the media. There's that famous interview with Brendan O'Connor where he's like, he's above politics. Somehow he's become a completely apolitical <laughs> T-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that on an interview with was it Saturday Night Live, what, Tonight or whatever the show on RTE yeah. was. It might have been the late, I think it was the late, late actually. Brendan O'Connor said he's above politics. He said he was above politics and apolitical. And that's yeah. how entrenched like the opinions of Fine Gael are in people who <laughs> comment in newspapers. They're just seen as apolitical common sense. Like what Baradkar says and does is just common sense. It's not political at all. What would, what would you say are the politics? What would you say and what would Brennan O'Connor say are the politics behind it? Leo Varadkar saying something like this was a couple of years or so ago there was housing was being debated in the Dáil as it frequently is and uh, the topic of landlords came up and Leo Varadkar says it's it's he's one of these <laughs> I think there are two kind of when you talk about things that Leo Varadkar said and we do want to talk about what he's what he actually did as well but the the things that he said I think that there are going to be the lines that he's going to be most remembered for are these are lines that he's kind of hated for yeah that that particular line of well, well it's important when we talk about landlords that we have to remember that one person's rent is another person's income it could yeah. be it could be their pension it could be paying their mortgage what would you say are the politics behind a statement like that and what would brennan o'connor <laughs> does brennan o'connor just say that that's apolitical well, I mean, he doesn't want, they don't want, uh, or they're terrified that if 
people who vote Fianna Gael go into negative equity that they'll no longer vote Fianna Gael so they have to kind of pay uh, lip service to trying to solve the housing crisis by saying that they're doing all of these things and they're enacting all of these measures but actually it's about making house prices stable or increase and also increasing uh, rents for the, the class that Fianna Gael serve. And he's a landlord himself which is like I'm always like when we talk about TDs, ministers, and above in Leo Radcliffe's case, being a landlord, you know, it's not necessarily for me about, oh, this is a specific, this is a specific thing about Leo Varadkar which will make him act specifically biased in specific instances, but more an indication of where his class interests lie. Um, Equally with Varadkar, I mean, you're talking about you're talking about um, how they have to pay lip service about solving the housing crisis. But equally, one of his other greatest hits, of course, was he was giving a it was a webinar with institutional property investors, among them what are known in the trade as cuckoo funds and vulture funds, where Varadkar's message to them was Ireland is open for business. Stick with us. Please, <laughs> prostrating himself in front of actually institutional uh, capital like that. And the lip service in that instance would be then putting in a was a ten percent stamp duty, saying, "Oh, we're we're trying to tackle this. We're doing something about it." And then all of the funds just go, "That's fine. <laughs> we'll pay that because we still get three hundred houses that we can rent out." Then, you know. And I mean, you know, one that I always go on about. Uh, it's a it's a continuation of his of his of his of his predecessor's legacy and the canny who you know in the in post crash ireland you had a man stephen schwartzman who is ceo of blackstone one of the biggest most influential most ruthless institutional landlords in the world stephen stephen schwartzman a guy who the quote most famously attributed to him is uh, you have to wait until there's blood in the street and that's when you buy up property and this is what he did across the world in the US and Europe to the point where it, uh, four or five years ago the UN uh, special rapporteur for housing one of her colleagues they sent letters to governments across across Europe using Blackstone as a case study where they said you need to stop allowing these you know funds like these come in hoover up properties drive the price of rent up drive drive the price of property up it, like it, absolutely exacerbating the housing crises in your respective countries right and they wrote to you know up governments across Europe and the Irish government was one of them <laughs> and like Gazig is like and a canny who 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 was Taoiseach while Stephen Schwartzman was hoovering our property in Ireland, and again he was like going playing golf with them, like and kind of going like <laughs> ah come on in and you know like buy up whatever you want, you know. And that's certainly Varadkar. Yeah, I mean, I suppose he has to. It's an interesting one as well, where you know support for Fine Gael by all accounts has bottomed out among people our age and older. Actually, you know, like well. It, 18 to 34 pluses in my in your case Roman, uh, Roman uh, they've had that kind of balancing act to play like where these people's parents certainly want their property prices to go up whereas their kids who are probably still living with them obviously obviously don't so it's been the kind of delicate kind of balancing act for Varadkar certainly rhetorically at least to give the illusion of doing something while yeah, like there, there, I, I remember I was just thinking like that there there was um, during the by election in Dublin Bay South, like a good a example of that was when, if you remember, uh, I think it was RTE, like they were just going around like asking people like, you know, what kind of issues they had and stuff like that. And they, there was a very like well to do woman in somewhere in Randall and they knocked on her door and you know, she said, um, you know, my three sons can't afford to buy in Ranala. So, yeah, like it, <laughs> it was, yeah, so it was basically, you know, yeah, like that, that's, that's the, the, the problem, like when you rely on people like that for your votes, but then, 
you know, it's a catch-22 because then, you know, their kids can't afford to, um, to buy a house. So how do you keep all those people uh, happy and you know I think by running James Cake and <laughs> yeah. <in the> like 68% <laughs> of people that RT article the other day said between the ages of 18 and yeah. 24 are living with their parents and that's like when it's all subsi- when the, the rental market is being subsidized by HAP and I don't think it's included say people with disabilities who can't get housing and that kind of thing there's certain groups that are, certain cohorts that were excluded from that statistic it's unbelievable and it's amazing how what's <laughs> what constitutes a young person, say, over the past 10 years, has oh, yeah. gradually <laughs> increased. It's going to get oh, to the yeah. point yeah. as the housing crisis gets more and more acute and we are all essentially serfs to giant vulture funds, yeah. giving them half of our income. We'll be told that, oh, young people, anybody under 60, you know, is... Uh, <laughs> is <laughs> Actually, <laughs> you know, uh, obviously there is this, you know, exodus of... Exodus of TDs from Fine Gael, guys who, I think it's up to 11 now, sitting TDs who've said, nah, not for me anymore. People like, uh, off the top of my head, Brendan Griffin down in Kerry, John Paul Phelan in Kilkenny, isn't he, I think? Um, the most recent one is Kieran Cannon in uh, in Galway. And it had been put to Varadkar over the, oh, over the past couple of days about, look, what the fuck are... Fine Gael going to do here and the example he gave was oh we've still got talent in the party Look, James Gagan is, <laughs> is one of them like James Gagan who ran in the by-election he was ultimately defeated by Ivana Bacic um, a couple of years back but he's an interesting case study as well where and we did did we do a story on this actually about his uh, well we did a story about where he about where he lives which he had gone around telling people effectively that he lived in Ranala when he didn't. He lived in Tlonsky. He did a he did a podcast um, or some sort of live Zoom or something with people under like a sign in the background that was the Ranala Lua stuff. I don't have you know like <laughs> yeah like it was <laughs> like it was very much you know like r- r- like Ranala was like you know being. I think one of his key policies was being from Ranla. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, from Ranla. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Famous like. election literature where he was like uh, standing outside of the spa in Ranla village, and there was just like a homeless person in the background, and yeah. they just put it on social media, and it's just they hadn't they hadn't even noticed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I mean, speculate if you want, or I mean, you know, he's got a house in Klonski, which is what I would we call it, uh, conservatively uh, in and around the half million mark. <laughs> then he just, but he goes more just, than that. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice area. But then he also just happens to have as parents, Gig and Jay. <laughs> and like, you know, comes with a long line of, of generational wealth. So people like that, certainly of his age. Yeah, I mean, you also had people, when this was brought up, you had, uh, a lot of fucking Egypt's basically going like, well, where do you, where do you expect a barrister to live? <laughs> like, you know, guys yeah. who kind of no understanding really of the, of of the industry and you know the time it takes to kind of build up something of a something of a profile for yourself, which you know, look again, we're, we're speculating here. <laughs> like, yeah, you'd be amazed how many barristers aren't even registered for VAT. Because they don't yeah, meet the yeah. threshold, like. But yeah, it was just presumed like that. Oh, he's a barrister. He must be earning millions, you know. On uh, on on barristers and Fine Gael, the other, you know, the other uh, saintly profession for people like that are doctors. This for, this is a it's a bugbear of mine. This reflexive sort of beatification of oh oh doctors doctors oh like aren't you. <laughs> aren't you great kind of thing like aren't you know you're saving people etc etc Varadkar of course a doctor uh, what do you think about his what do you think about his time as healthcare minister wasn't great was it? <laughs> it's interesting although I don't, I don't think anyone's time as health minister has been great though is it Ever. no but talk about the ideology of, well, I mean, Ma- Mary Harney said in 2006 that um, A&E's across the country were in crisis because 495 people were on trolleys and we have exceeded that fi- figure on a weekly basis including I think last week since then so by the government by the politicians own uh, 
metric, the National Health, the health Service has been in crisis for coming on 20 years now. Leo Varadkar had a tenure in health minister and things just continued to <laughs> further deteriorate. Um, for me, the enduring memory of you know, his impact on health is actually to do with the, the COVID response. And the how mean girls quote. <laughs> this is like <laughs> not all heroes work. There hate. is no limit. No, it was how the government had in, in the one in one year they had you know uh, medical expert uh, experts and <laughs> you know people who were qualified to comment on what a public response health response should be, and on the other they had restaurateurs and publicans, oh, and they were mm -hmm. they were trying to meet them in the middle. So you had the absurd situation where it was apparently safe to go and eat in a restaurant if you ordered a meal that cost what was it, like ten euro oh, or fifteen. Yeah year or something like that so um, I mean look under health, no one wants to be health minister because it's um, the health service is in such a bad way it's a it's a black hole they continue to throw money at it and it just continues to deteriorate and he's had a hand in that well he also I mean to kind of move a little bit forward you know uh, village Magazine story on him leaking a document to his friend Matthew O'Toole, a GP. One of the follow-up stories to that came from Jack Horgan Jones in the Irish Times, who uh, Jack went and did a Freedom of Information request, and he managed to get. It's rare that you get these in FOI requests, but he managed to get text messages. Uh, they were WhatsApp messages between Varadkar and Matthew O'Toole, where. There was this sort of standoff between O'Toole was the president of the now defunct GPs union, the NAGP, and they were basically threatening to pull their support for Fine Gael and they weren't going to campaign for them. They weren't going to canvass for them. It, they, they weren't being explicit about whom they were going to get behind, but they were threatening to pull this support unless unless government paid them basically and Varadkar in his text to Machu O'Toole he said he said like words to the effect of Sinn Féin and leftists want you on salaries and not big ones about 60k uh said that said that the and then also warned he said the Labour Party want to make GP GP care free for children and he said and he signed off by saying the words foot and shoot spring to mind so this was this was Varadkar speaking to his contemporary another doctor another guy and funny enough Machu too was made a bit of a name for himself during the COVID response he had a bit of a halo on him as well you know um we have to pull together like and he was you know played a blinder, sink, played a blinder, during played the, a blinder. You know? but you could see this was Varadkar speaking to his contemporary and and he was and he was saying to him like see if Sinn Féin get into power you're not going to be a rich doctor anymore and if, I don't know like for me like it does kind of sometimes you know the types who it, it's just for me it's kind of amazing that it, it, there's never really any kind of suggestion of the kinds of people oftentimes who or the economic urge on the part of some people to go and uh, study medicine in in Irish colleges but then like it also plays out with you could see Varadkar and his I mean Jim Farader has written about how when Varadkar was health minister he was he was Jim Farader called him a tout for private health insurance where Varadkar just after he had turned 36 he he told reporters oh I just got in and I signed up for my private health insurance there didn't want to be hit with that levy there he's also you know he, he opens um quite recently in, at the start of this year he turned this or sorry the start of last year actually he, he, he turned the sod uh, at a private hospital in in Limerick uh, the, the Bon Secours uh, which also <laughs> the Bon Secours yeah yeah who ran what was uh, the, the 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 mother and baby home in Tume that was the site of a mass grave of children you know um, but this is you know he like on the one hand, I think sometimes there can be a tendency to read too much into things to things people like Varadkar say, but oftentimes I think the things that they say give an indication of what the underlying ideology that motivates political choices made by people like Varadkar, you know. Arguably, sometimes on the left, people 
can just go with what Varadkar says without really kind of looking at what it all means ideologically. Now, on the other hand, people on the right tend to just go, I mean, like we had years of, do you know, like that picture of him with Trudeau and his socks? Yes. The two, <laughs> the two woke bays of the Western world. Do you have a favorite Varadkar photo op? Um, I think there was one, uh, I don't know if it was during COVID, where he was in like, was he in a shoe shop? Right. And he was trying on shoes, like, I can't remember exactly, like, yeah, I think all, like, usually, like, the best ones are the ones with the socks, like, I'm big the fan media of just loved it. I love the one of him picking his nose at a festival. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, on the one on Trudeau, there was, you could see when Trudeau made that state visit to Dublin, there was this, I mean, Varadka really fawned over him. This was, this was at a time when Trudeau really had his tail up. He was the woke bay of the Western world. And you could see that there was this inclination from Varadka going, oh, let's just plant in Irish people's minds that I'm the Irish version of Trudeau. And Macron as well, I think. He oh, has, Macron, he had, he had, yeah, he had yeah. a mind in a, in, a, in a big way. Yeah, you know? states people, like from, as if you'd see them on the West Wing kind of thing. Um, yeah. But one thing that is, look, sometimes it's maybe overstated a little bit, but, you know, there has been, Trudeau certainly doesn't have his tail up to the same degree as he did back when he posed with Varadkar and his socks outside government buildings. Varadkar certainly doesn't either. Um, arguably part of what has, in some circles, come to be referred to as an anti-woke backlash. Like, first of all, we'll get into what woke means. <laughs> Do you think Varadkar is woke? I mean, he was woke from, what was it, 20... 15 to 2019 when the prevailing wind was going that way. What do you mean by when you say well? Well, he was him and Fine Gael more broadly were a lot more keen to try and um, let people know about what they think they are, about their liberal credentials, right? So they would try and take credit for, say, the marriage equality referendum. They try and take uh, credit for uh, the repeal of the Eighth Amendment. They'd even invoke referendums from the past, like say the divorce referendum, and they'd say like, all of this social progress, Fine Gael is uh, responsible for it. And we are, you know, we're woke kings, we're <laughs> and it's a way of obscuring class relations, isn't it? And kind of giving the ruling class a veneer of legitimacy. So people go, oh, isn't it brilliant that like, we have a female CEO or something like that, you know, and it's kind of, doesn't look at say, I don't know, the CEO is paying the people at the bottom <laughs> <laughs> the minimum wage in there, <laughs> below the poverty line. What do you think is the wokest thing Varadkar has ever done? God, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I like... Do you think he's woke? And we will get to what is, what is woke, and also whether there has been... I mean, you know, people on the right and farther right call him a communist. <laughs> Yeah, but like, I think this is the problem, like where a lot of these words like just have lost any sort of meaning. Like, I mean, you've, you've people applying like any sort of kind of, you know, even minor change in anything is, you know, you've people saying it's woke, but like without kind of setting out, like what exactly does that mean? You know, is it virtue signaling? Is that, what is it like? Yeah. And, and what is it to you though? I mean, I, I like <laughs> to me. Like I think, you know, an example of woke. Uh, I think a legitimate example of woke would be like Adon or Reardon going down to Mount Street and like being photographed. Um, you know, doing a bit of tidying up, like with the the tents on Mount Street, when you know his party and himself like were responsible for some of the most like damaging um policies uh social policies in you know the past couple of decades like when labor were in government with Fine Gael. 
that sort of stuff like it, but like maybe that's more kind of virtue signaling but i think the two things have kind of been mangled together and i i, I think like the problem is that you know people people see through that sort of stuff but then when you people come along <coughs> and try to kind of um propose genuinely like progressive measures that will materially benefit um you know poorer people or more vulnerable people in society it's all thrown in together do you know what i mean like it's all woke you know so you, you have the lines kind of blurred now between you know virtue signaling and being woke and it's just it's hard to kind of know what's what anymore you know i think like when as I understand it, it's a kind of um, it's an approach to politics that makes a virtue of kind of performative and symbolic gestures of inclusion and solidarity in order to obscure class relations. That's generally how it's used by the political class. But then, if you're say someone from the right, it's just kind of anyone who's calling for access to basic resources <laughs> is woke, you know, and intransigent and unreasonable and needs to just learn the value of a hard day's work. So. That's that. I think you're right. Like, it kind of, it's it's a it's a nebulous term, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Which is why it's so perfect because <laughs> you can invoke it, and no one, everyone has their own definition. Like I like I actually hate the term. I hate the term because yeah. well, first of all, it doesn't mean anything because you know when something when something comes to mean everything, well then it means nothing right, as well. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I'm kind of like. I'm almost kind of like outing myself like where I'll say that like my main gripe with the word and how it's applied and how it's used is that I actually do think that it's rank what has become of the word where, you know, it used to be a very simple but quite powerful term that African-Americans used to get across the fact that they were woke to the injustices that were perpetrated against them during the fight for civil rights in the US. Then at some point, there was that American actor, wasn't it, who became known as the Woke Bay? It was some guy like 10 years ago or so ago on Twitter who would come on Twitter and say stuff like, it's really good to be a man and a feminist. Like, <laughs> and just like the most, like, like like the most platitudinous bullshit like you know or kind of go like you know i i respect women like, go, like wow, you're, you are is very yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you are you are class fair play to you. and like i think it was ever so briefly i mean like 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 right now i don't know anyone like either in person or you know anyone anywhere who uses the term sincerely and earnestly to say oh yeah i'm i'm woke by the way it's, it's Theresa may say she was woke and proud at one point <laughs> did she actually yeah. Yeah. a few years ago um but other than her i don't i'm not aware of anyone it's it's since it just comes from the right as a way of you yeah. know having a go at people who are under 35 and are upset that they're never going to own a fucking house yeah. <laughs> in, in introducing like you know fucking free tampax to universities is woke but that's all to the, like good, to, to, though, the, like, to the no 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 but yeah, i'm saying I'm like the, <laughs> <laughs> no but i'm saying like i'm saying like to, to these people that you see like commenting on this stuff like there you know there'll be people saying like that that's that's just woke yeah do you know what i mean well, when, when it's not like but with... yeah but it, it it's just kind of like you know, it's just, it, it's applied to everything. Like, it's, it's, it's not just even the word woke. Like, I've seen people saying that Leo Varadkar is a Marxist. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, because there might be some, like, vaguely kind of progressive He's a Marxist, measure yeah. and it'd be like, <laughs> some Leo Varadkar is a communist. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, like, and I mean, he was actually asked specifically, you know, it's funny how these things go where, you know, the word woke has been... Ireland's always a few years behind and all this kind of stuff where you have... It's, it's, a, it's a whole big dumb debate, really, like where you have uh, Sharon Keoghan, the senator, and Willie O'Dea, in the aftermath of the two defeated referenda, have both said... Like, Willie O'Dea said something like, oh, Fianna Fáil have to stop playing to the woke gallery. Now, now this is a guy, Willie O'Dea, back when the gender recognition 
act was being passed. This is like, you know, <laughs> Willie O'Dee, what is he in his 70s now? Like, you know, uh, man from Limerick. Like, he got up in the door and he said, this gender recognition act that will allow, that will, you know, that will afford a protection and bestow basic human rights on trans people in Ireland. He said, this is a good thing, but it doesn't go far enough. And like, that uh, sounds pretty woke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like by by the standards that are that, n- how we now talk about these things. Like yeah, Willie O'Dea was quote unquote woke back in 2015. I think Eamon O'Keefe said similar about the Gender Recognition Act as well while it was going through the doll. Whereas, and certainly, I'm not sure if Leo Radker has ever said that he's woke, but now unbelievably crass more than anything Philip Ryan who was over on that trip to the US for St. Patrick's Day wrote a piece the headline of which was you know I'm not woke for Adger I mean you see the way it's written like Philip Ryan asks for Adger oh, are you woke and he says no I don't think I'm woke and then it goes on to what say what a fucking question is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then he the most awkward fucking segue of all time then where he then segues into something about Gaza where he goes like so are, are, are you woke Mr. Varadkar and he's like no 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 I'm I'm not woke what about this genocide which it was kind of a neat little kind of vignette of the, the kind of pointlessness and the just how how all of this stuff is really just aesthetic bullshit, like whether someone's woke or not, when compared with a material issue like like Israel and Gaza right now, you know. But this is, you know, uh, there was something in the Irish Times then about, it was uh, Joe Humphreys, he was putting the question to uh, Senator Sharon Keoghan and and Willie O'D kind of asking them just what just what is woke like what do you mean when you when you when you say woke which is I don't know I think we all know what they mean who taught Sharon Keoghan the term terminally online oh, yeah. <laughs> who was working for her and has a Twitter account and told her that because someone told it to her and she said it in the uh, it's in the doll record now the term I'm sick of these terminally online woke mob people yeah. <laughs> but uh, like one of the things that people will routinely say is woke will be like the hate speech bill Sharon Keoghan uh, a big a, a big opponent of it uh, she's spoken about it at length in yeah. the Shannon she's made it a an important part of her political brand and identity that you know she is she is for free speech She's, yeah, as I said, yeah, vocal opponent of this free speech bill. Uh, but she's a good example as well where, again, quite recently, about half a year or so ago, she st- she stood up in the Shannon and she made an intervention about uh, Juno Dawson's book, This Is Gay, it's called. It, like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, which was, it was, it, it, it was placed on a school curricula and it was in school libraries and obviously I accessible to two students and it had been placed on these curricula by people who work in education who I mean like I would say you kind of looked at things and went it's probably better that kids learn about sex from books rather than in the schoolyard kind of thing you know yeah. this predictably then the book itself caused this massive backlash people and those fucking idiots who go they were going around Ireland and that wee boat of theirs and showing up and showing up in like rural towns and going into libraries and like just harassing librarians going like do you have this gay book in here like you know but like sorry was the book was the book literally called this yeah, is gay, this is gay yeah. <laughs> I can just imagine the reaction like when they saw yeah. Yeah. like the, 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 the book is called this is gay this is gay yeah. <laughs> but that's all that's all fine like isn't it isn't it amazing how that was never framed as an attack on democracy the way some other actions yeah. by these people were because I mean surely in order for democracy to function you need to have an educated and an informed citizenry and having access to library services is an important part of that, right? That was never framed as an, a, an attack on democracy. That only happened when 
uh, was it uh, Michael Healy Ray was walking outside of the door and a piece he, of shit. And they called and people who he had been made he'd been kind of pandering to a bit, yeah. you know, with comments that he'd made about uh, was it transgender people and, and that kind of thing. Gave him a few shoves and then all of a sudden it was this is an attack on democracy, this is an attack on, you know, <laughs> free I, speech I, or I whatever. I think it started it with Anne Robert. Oh, when someone threw a sealed bag of cow shit. Media got on board with that one. Did they did, yeah. That was like, that, that, our very democracy was under threat when that happened. Did it, yeah, and it was, it's mute if, say, if someone shows up at a left-wing TD's house or a left-wing politician's house. There's very, very, very little said about it as all, at all because the... by Joan Burton and Joe <laughs> Stein, like, yeah. you know, face it, not guilty. But like, with Sharon Kilgan, like, she has got up in the doll and, or sorry, in the Shannon. She's got up in the Shannon and she has spoken about this book, This Is Gay. And uh, not only has she, look, it's one thing going into libraries and hassling, hassling librarians and harassing people trying to access books. That's, that's one thing. What Sharon Kyogen did in the Shannon was she got up and she specifically said she wanted to find out who put this book on the junior cycle curriculum and she wanted this person to face consequences like she wanted this person to lose their job you know so if you're an absolute free speech absolutist which you know they're, they're likely isn't really a thing there's you know this occurs on a spectrum you know yeah. i'm kind of a little bit as far as people go on the left i actually would be quite you know in a very narrow sense i like to think i am actually quite you know quite an absolutist as far maybe a little bit of an outlier on the left but in in the narrow sense that i don't think that people should be persecuted or penalized by the state for things they say or think and here you have sharon kilgan who is supposedly she's an you know an icon for these you know the anti-woke free speech brigade she's getting up in the shadow and she's calling for the state to, to sanction someone who works in education because they placed this book on on a junior cycle curriculum. Now I know that now people will just say that I'm a groomer for <laughs> for did, the event in this book. Did did she just get up in the in, in the the Senate and in the Shannon and say like hold the book up and say this is gay? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all free speech is to these people. It's just like the ability to say bigoted shit on the internet and not lose your Twitter account over it. It's yeah. it comes down to that, like you know. Yeah. Generally, like unprincipled people. Well, there'd be nothing about say. Well, we're all hypocrites in our own way, like. But it's like it's funny when, when you make it such a central part of your brand that you can't do the basics of. All right, let's not call for the state to come down hard on people who, in this instance, have you know contributed to the devising of a curriculum for junior cycle students. Yeah, and very, very few of them, you know, had much to say when, say, Michal Martin said what he said about the ditch. Ah, uh, you can say what you want about people like the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Because the ditch is woke. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, ditch yeah, is... Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, I, like, yeah... I, I, like, there certainly are people who, who would call us woke. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there are those who would, who would argue, like, you know, and the fact yeah. that... Every now and then, like we, we've talked about this before, though, like you will have like a string of stories and it'll get a bit of traction, and then we'll publish a comment piece, and there'll be these guys who are like, What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> the ditch is woke. Like, yeah, sorry, guys. Like, hate to break it to you, but yeah. All of this as well, related to Varadkar's resignation, related to woke, anti woke, related to public debate and poor Anne Rabbit who you just invoked Kieran Cannon Galway East TD it, who we mentioned earlier one of the Fine Gael TDs who is he's done he's out draw pouring one out for Kieran Cannon he's not <laughs> running in the next general election I believe he did the state some service oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> lots of people are actually saying that like you know lot, I've, I, like I've seen a lot of uh, he was whether you agreed or not with his politics, he was a... A politician. He was a politician. <laughs> he was elected. Nobody can deny that Kieran Cannon was, was a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can deny that. But he, and this is the part of his, you know, threw up a statement on Twitter, you know, and quite 
near the top of his statement, he said, it's that word nobody likes to see toxicity in politics. He said it's certainly a factor, certainly a factor, the increased toxicity that he's seen in political life is a, one of the reasons why he stepped down. And he referred back to, he said, 20 years ago. It's like, all right, yeah. <laughs> what was going on 20 years ago? Like he, he said it, things were much better for politics than 20 years ago. You know, 2004, when we were in the middle of the Celtic Tiger and you had... Uh, I think things were much better for everyone 20 yeah, years ago. <laughs> People weren't complaining back when the Celtic Tiger was going on. Like, <laughs> now they don't seem to... They don't seem to like me anymore, you know? How... How toxic do you think the ditch is? <laughs> no, like, <laughs> how toxic do you think political life is? Well, like, I don't know. Like, if you'd say, like look at say the last couple of weeks the government got its arse handed to it um in two referendums after they deliberately tried to mislead the electorate as to what the uh two <laughs> woke referendums two woke referendums okay. as to what the legal impact uh, of, of passing them would be um after that um it's, they flew to washington where they pledged allegiance to american imperialism paid some lip service to what was happening uh, to people that's in just Palestine. by the way to jump in really quick, that's the one nice thing I would say about Varadka is like in as much as these speeches mean anything his speech was actually like really good it's better, it's yeah, better but it's, than it's, yeah but it's rhetoric and you're there breaking bread yeah, yeah. with the guy who is who is arming a campaign of genocidal violence the eve before St. Patrick's Day uh, <laughs> people came in and fucking scooped up 200 international protection applicants and dump them down in County Wicklow because they were afraid that it would be embarrassing uh, if if tourists saw them. So like, who is being toxic here, <laughs> right? Um, politicians have had a uh, significant contribution to the atmosphere. I think the housing crisis as well has a big part to, to do with it. It's like the, the social fabric, like the web of connections that actually makes people into communities, right? And, and um, is starting to erode and until recently enough politicians have been insulated by it but now things are getting or from it and now things are getting so bad and these people are becoming so brazen in part actually because the state refuses to clamp down on the far right that it's beginning to impact politicians and now they're saying oh this is too toxic but like a lot of the atmosphere and a lot of what's happening is a direct result of political choices how how toxic was the ditch to Niall Collins? Because <laughs> Niall <laughs> Collins is one of the guys. Niall Collins, junior minister from Limerick. We did a series of stories about him around this time last year. About big ones were about his role in the sale of public land to his wife. Niall Collins, after Kieran Cannon's statement. And the, the thing is, whenever a politician comes out and says, things are toxic for politicians, politicians love this shit so like you had a cavalcade of politicians going oh yeah, yeah it's toxic for me too and then media love it as well because a lot of a lot of the mainstream press kind of get up on their high horses as well about you know oh it's toxic to be a journalist like you know um but now find people these, who yeah. won't become journalists or politicians <laughs> now they're being frightened away yeah. <laughs> but now collins was one of these he he came out and he said hey, it's toxic for politicians. How toxic were we to now, Collins? Um, You're a pretty toxic guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like I think the bad vibes. It kind of, uh, I'd go back a little bit and say like that. You know, you basically have a situation where politicians routinely like to take credit for things, good things that happen. And uh, to a certain degree, like the media has insulated and insulated them from having to do the opposite, which is take a bit of flack for things when they don't go wrong. Um, you know, and that basically you have this situation where any sort of like criticism, like today, for example, and I know like they're not talking about other uh, necessarily other politicians usually. It's usually about people on Twitter or whatever. But like Holly Cairns said today, like we need a general election. You know, in response to Varadkar resigning, and there was people replying like saying that that was toxic. That's the most toxic thing I've ever heard in my entire life. It was like, <laughs> it, it was fucking insane. Like people were saying, 
I, it's I no Holly wonder Car people don't want to get into politics <laughs> when <laughs> Holly Carnes is calling for a general election. I thought Holly Carnes was woke, but you're telling me that she's toxic now. She's rebranded as toxic. toxic and woke. Um, like it's it's just mad. Like where, you know, like what exactly do you expect? Like when you get into politics, like people are going to have a go at you. Do you know what I mean? Like there's people who work, you know, in jobs that are paid a fifth of what TDs get and would get like similar abuse, uh, you know, on a daily basis, like from people. Do you know what I mean? Like bus drivers would get more abuse, I would say, than politicians on a daily basis. Like it's just, it's ridiculous, like pandering to this sort of like idea that politicians should just be allowed to take credit for all the good things and nobody should be allowed to challenge them about, you know, the fucking toxic things that but they're doing like, to society. What do you think is you know? going to happen though? Like did you oversee the country deteriorating for say what, at least the last 15 years in terms of public services, in terms of, <laughs> you know, opportunities for people, uh, in terms of levels of inequality, child homelessness. And the entire time you tell, you tell people that actually everything is fucking class. Look at my graph. This is amazing. <laughs> the economy is doing class. And yeah, people are really angry and really upset. And you know, if you, if you, preside over things getting as bad as they have, then unfortunately it's to be expected that certain norms and conventions about how you treat elected officials are going to start to deteriorate as well. That is a really toxic thing to say. Really <laughs> disappointed. Yeah. I, I just think like you can't have your cake and eat it. Like you can't fucking say, you know, oh, I, you know, Fine Gael is doing this. Like we've, you know, introduced this policy and isn't this fucking great and you know then the media saying oh well like you know to be fair to the minister like this is very progressive and blah 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 and then you know when they do something that's fucking shit you know where you have people basically saying uh, that you know you have to separate the minister from the policy do you know what I mean when it's something bad like you yeah. know they're human at the end of the day and like we can't you know, this is this is just a decision that they've taken. You know, we shouldn't like. You know, we shouldn't focus on the person. It's just a decision. Yeah, like yeah. it's not like the same as people going like, oh, that you can, like Manchester by the Sea. You can still think it's a great film, even though Casey Affleck's in it. It's not the fucking same thing. But that's how people tend to speak about these kind of things. Like, yeah. let's separate the art from the artist. We are just at the point of the show, everyone's favourite, Big Paulie Doyle's Take of the Week, brought to you in collaboration <laughs> with Borden and Mona, because when you're Irish, you're like an old peat fire or some shite like that. Paulie, what's the crack? What's your Take of the Week? The Take of the Week wasn't actually written by an individual this time. It's actually a, a newspaper's take. It's a take of uh, the Business Post. And it's business post. Was, it written, <laughs> <laughs> was it written by AI? Yes. Ah, oh, so it's an Irish time. Are you sure it's not an Irish time article? <laughs> it's the Business Post view about the housing crisis, and it is that the removal of rent uh, caps, it, the removal of rent caps is the secret to unlocking the delivery of 50,000 homes. Uh, when this current government feels like it is beginning to make progress on housing, worrying news emerges to show it is nowhere near enough. That doesn't really make sense, um, but that's, that's also the view. Um, okay, so. What do we think of this? Um, are rent caps um, a direct obstacle to solving the housing crisis? Are things not interesting enough for landlords, or financially that is? Do they need even more of your income? What it's do you think? It's the same like happens, happens across the world. You know, most recently uh, California proposition, proposition 10, which was ultimately defeated. This was a, this was a referendum in California that would have extended rent caps across the state basically and this referendum campaign was man it was a subject of like th like people like the collisons were pumping the no campaign full of cash and other kind of people in that you know those guys the eac tech bros kind of guys oh yeah those kind of guys pumping it full of uh full of cash you've also seen i think i think i'm right in saying paul crewman you know superstar economist writes with the new york times he's also an uh, he's an anti-rent caps kind of guy and the argument is always the same that 
if you introduce rent caps, well then landlords will leave the market or landlords won't be incentivized to provide provide housing. It's this kind of, I don't know, it, it, to me it's just, it's, it's accommodation, well, you know, states and local authorities and populations allowing themselves to be held hostage by landlords to not just say, yeah, fuck it, we're going to introduce rent caps. One of, the, like it. one of the things, the rent cap introduced in 2021, for understandable reasons, has been a disaster for attracting foreign capital to buy new homes. It's an inter like what, so is this taking it for granted that institutional investors, which have had a huge hand in actually, you know, exacerbating the housing crisis, are actually a force for good because they increase supply, even though no one can fucking afford to live in the houses? Well, that's, that's like Fine Gael's ideology. That's yeah. the government's ideology. Like that, th that article reflects the, the what the government wants. They're, they they excuse me. You need to. They they are holding truth to. <laughs> they're speaking truth to power. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for joining us for episode two of our podcast with Red Wolf. We want to sincerely apologise to Lucinda Creighton. We ran out of time. Hopefully, we'll have her on next week. Stick with us for what's going to be a lovely series here with Red Wolf and the Deaths. Thanks so much. Thank you.